الحمد للہ رب العالمین والصلاۃ والسلام سیدنا محمد و علیہ و صحب اجمعین عمر استنبی سنتی بحسان اللہ یوم الدین الحم الحق حقا و رسکن تیبا و عین الباطل باطلا و رسکن اجتناب السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ I'd like to welcome you on to another session of commentary from the 40 hadith of Imam al-Nawawi rahimahullah and you know alhamdulillah now we're going into hadith number three looked at the life of Imam Nawawi in the introduction and we also discussed in depth the first hadith and we also looked at the second hadith which is hadith Jibreel um, and now we're going to actually go into hadith number three which is the hadith on the five pillars of Islam so let us begin so an abi abdir rahman abdillah bin umar bin khattab radhi anhuma qal sami'tu rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yaqul bunya al-islam ala khams shahadati an la ilaha illa allah wa anna muhammadar rasulullah wa iqami as-salah wa ita'i az-zakah wa hajj al-bayt wa sawmi ramadan rawahu al-bukhari wa muslim and the translation of the matan on the authority of abu abdir rahman abdullah bin umar bin khattab who are the anhuma may allah's pleasure be on both of them who said i heard the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam saying islam has been built upon five five things on testifying that there is no god except allah and that muhammad is his messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam Performing the salah, giving the zakah, performance of the hajj to the house, and fasting during Ramadan. And this has been narrated in the books of Al-Bukhari and Muslim. They're sahihain. So as the tradition of our commentary is, we're going to go into some important aspects from the life of the narrator and here the narrator is actually the son of the great person who narrated the first two hadith which is Abdullah bin Omar or Ibn Omar. So Abdullah bin Omar he would observe and scrutinize closely everything that the Prophet ﷺ would do okay. in fact to its utmost level for example if he saw that the Prophet ﷺ descended from his camel at a certain place and pray to Raqqa, he would do the same when he had the occasion to pass through the same route. This was the extent where Abdullah bin Umar emulated the Prophet in almost every detail which he did. Aisha anha remarked that there was no one who followed the footsteps of the Prophet in the places where he descended, as did Ibn Umar. At-Tabi, by the name of Maymun ibn Mahran, narrated the following. I entered the house of Ibn Umar. I estimated everything in his house, including his bed, his blanket, his carpet, and everything else in it. What I found was not even a hundred dirhams worth. This was not because Abdullah bin Umar was poor. No, rather he was rich, but he was generous and liberal. He was not a miser. Furthermore, in the times of fitna, after the passing of the Prophet ﷺ, after the passing of or the death of Ali Radan, during the times of fitna and the war between Muslims, Ibn Omar maintained neutrality and said that he would not let a hair be torn between him and another Muslim for his cause or for his case. That's why he stayed away from the fitna. He did not take a side because he did not want to be involved in that type of bloodshed. But however, he would not be shy to speak out against the butcher al-Hajjaj when he slandered Ibn Zubair, who was murdered, who Hajjaj murdered. He slandered him as saying false things against Hajjaj and he spoke out against him. And actually, as an effect, a person who was a supporter of Hajjaj wounded him when he was making a tawaf around the Kaaba and he succumbed to the wounds of the same person who supported Hajjaj and he died because of those wounds. Ibn Omar was a giant, just like his father. And he actually, in the status of the Sahaba, 
he was right up there. In fact, it would not be incorrect to say that he had the qualifications of being the Khalifa. However, there was one person who barred him for that. Not that he ever sought that. He never sought, he did not seek leadership. He stayed away from it. But his father disqualified him from being one of those who could be selected as a Khalifa. However, he made Abdullah bin Umar from those who was involved in the leadership choosing. Okay. And again, the beautiful thing about look at justice of his father, that he crushed nepotism, which is a huge problem in the leadership of the Muslim Ummah at various levels, whether it be the, the top or the bottom, where the massages are being run and organized and so on and so forth. Anyway, let's go back to this life of Ibn Umar. And there was a beautiful story about him and the lion. Once Abdullah bin Omar set off on a journey, and on the way he saw some people stopped in their tracks. When he inquired about the reason, he was told that there was a lion in the way, and that people were afraid of it. Ibn Omar dismounted and went up to the lion straight. He caught the lion's ear, he twisted it, and slapped it on its neck, and he pushed it away from the path. Look at the bravery of Ibn Omar, not even afraid of a lion. Then he said, the Messenger of Allah did not inform us incorrectly. I heard the Messenger of Allah say, only that thing overpowers the son of Adam, which he feels afraid of it. If he does not fear anything besides Allah, nothing will overpower him except Allah. And this is narrated by Imam Ibn Kathir in Al-Bidayah wa Nihaya. So introduction to the Hadith. And this hadith emphasizes the fundamentals of the outward aspects of the submission to Allah. And this is Islam, of course. The definition of Islam is similar to the structure of building. If a person fulfills these aspects, he has laid down a solid foundation for his deen as a home. Remember the last hadith where Rasul Sussam said, فَإِنَّهُ جِبْرِيلْ أَتَاكُمْ يُعَلِّمُكُمْ دِينَكُمْ He came to teach you your deen. Okay. What deen here basically is described as a home. Now why five pillars? Well, perhaps this is related to the fact that the Bedouins in the time of the people at the time were familiar with tents. A tent requires five pegs or supports. Okay. It's not just four. There's four from the outside and one in the middle. So all these pegs support the tent. With the, any of these pegs, it would collapse. So similarly, Similarly, if a person fails to fulfill these obligations of upholding these pillars, and the entire structure of his deen or iman is threatened. And this is why the requirement and the importance and the essentiality of these five pillars is mentioned here again in this hadith. Collapse of the structure depends on how much of the pillar or the pillars are being violated, with the violation of the shahada being the most dangerous. It's in the middle. It's in the middle. It's, if it collapses, forget about it. The whole thing is going to go down. In a wider sense, this hadith is really part of Hadith Jibreel, which we talked about last week. Scholars say that the reason why Al-Imam al-Nawawi included this hadith in his collection, despite repeating a part of Hadith number 2, Hadith Jibreel, is because of the importance of the five pillars to Islam. So again, this is more highlighting this outward aspect of Islam which are the five pillars. So this hadith is really part of Hadith Jibreel. Okay. The other acts of Islam mentioned elsewhere, like in Hadith 2 and elsewhere, can be taken as the finishing touches to complete this structure. Because a house, it has five pillars, so just say, but the pillars don't make the house. We need something else. You need walls, you need ceiling, you need windows, you need other important furnishings and finishing touches to make this house something beautiful. Okay? And that is our Islam. That is our Islam. So we're right now constructing our Islam from the first, which is the Niyyah. Then we have Hadith Jibreel, which talks about Islam, Iman, Ihsan, and other aspects such as Suluk, and Al-Ghaib. And then now this Hadith is again emphasizing the importance of the pillars because without the pillars, the whole structure, our whole Islam is going to collapse. There's many lessons from this Short hadith. Okay. And one is the use of metaphors and similes. Okay. 
This hadith uses a metaphor likening Islam to a structure which we just mentioned. A structure of a building to affirm certain important principles. The use of metaphor and simile can be found in many suwar of the Quran and also several ahadith. Thus, there are important ways these metaphors to teach and exemplify important Islamic concepts and principles. One thing to note is that the word pillar, amad or imad, pillars, there's not a hadith which specifically or explicitly states that. So this is basically extracted from the hadith Buni al-Islam. Islam is built upon. It's built upon the five and it's understood that the five are pillars. And this is where we get the famous five pillars. Everyone in Islam, every Muslim knows the five pillars. Okay. But that word pillar has actually been extracted from this hadith where it uses this as an implied metaphor. In Surah Tawbah, in Ayah 109, Allah Azawajal says, أَفَمَنْ أَسَّسَ بُنْيَانَهُ عَلَىٰ تَكْوَىٰ مِنَ اللَّهِ وَرِدْوَانٍ خَيْرٌ أَمَّنْ أَسَّسَ بُنْيَانَهُ عَلَىٰ شَفَىٰ جُرُفٍ عَلَىٰ شَفَىٰ جُرُفٍ هَارٍ فَنْهَارًا فَنْهَارًا بِهِ فِي نَارِ جَهَنَّمْ وَاللَّهُ لَا يَحْدِ الْكَوْمَ الظَّالِمِينَ In translation, then is the one who laid the foundation of his building on righteousness or taqwa from Allah seeking his approval better or the one who laid the foundation of his building on the edge of a bank about to collapse so it collapsed with him in the fire of hell and Allah does not guide the ghali moon the wrongdoing people okay. so here in Surah Tawbah a similar metaphor is used as in this hadith the structure of the deen of a believer is based on a sound foundation whereas the structure of the munafiq is established on weak ground which may lead to collapse of the structure resulting in the disbeliever entering into the hellfire Jahannam okay. furthermore you have another example in Surah Jum'ah in ayah number 5 where Allah Azawajal says مَثَلُ الَّذِينَ حُمِّلُوا الطَّوْرَاتَ ثُمَّ لَمْ يَحْمِلُوهَا كَمَثَلِ الْحِمَارِ يَحْمِلُوا وَسْفَارًا The example of those who were entrusted with the Tawrah and then did not take it on is like that of a donkey who carries volumes of books. So here in Surah Jum'ah, a metaphor is being used to condemn those who fail to fulfill their amanah or religious obligations. And this was of course Banu Israel, the children of Israel, who failed to obey Allah's commandments in the Torah and are described by the metaphor of a donkey carrying heavy books on its back. And of course a donkey cannot extract any understanding from these books. Okay. And scholars have said that this metaphor of course applies to this Ummah. So all that knowledge that the donkey is carrying is worthless unless it is applied and used. So it's a trust. Okay. So no utility of that knowledge, just like a donkey carrying books. Okay. And in this Ummah also, example can come from Andalus. I mean, Andalus was the jewel of the Khilafah in our history. And it was the height of, you could say, Islamic civilization in terms of technology, in terms of ilm. So many classical works have come from scholars of Andalus. However, it did not benefit the Ummah because they became astray. And they did not apply that knowledge for the greater good. And then now basically we have Andalus as a barren land. Like Ad and Thamud, Ma'adullah. Not one single Muslim left. And this was at the hands of the Muslims themselves and what they did. In terms of, for example, Ayah of Surah Jum'ah. Not fulfilling the amana, the trust that was given to them. Because it's not just about the knowledge, it's not just about the wealth. That does not sustain you. It is about acting on the guidance which Allah Azza wa Jal gave us. So these are examples for us to ponder about, that we need to, it's a trust, we need to act on it, we need to do things as Muslims. It's not just lip service, it's not just about mere belief in the heart. 
Belief in the heart is manifested by actions and to fulfill the trust which Allah Azza gave us. And similarly, Baghdad, we have the sacking of Baghdad by the Tartars and uh, the great humiliation, all the volumes of books which were thrown into the river where its color turned the color of ink and so much of that knowledge lost. So it's not just about the knowledge, it's about applying it and fulfilling it. And that is the trust of ilm. So let's go forward and look more into some additional examples of metaphors. They're also utilized in some of the ahadith of the Prophet Wasallam. On the authority of Abu Musa al-Ashari, وَأَصَابَتْ مِنْهَا طَائِفَةً أُخْرَى إِنَّمَا هِيَا قِيْعَانٌ لَا تُمْسِكُ مَاءً وَلَا تُنْبِتُ كَلَى فَذَلِكَ مَثَلُ مَنْ فَقْوَهَا فِي دِينِ اللَّهِ وَنَفَعَهُ مَا بَأَثَنِ اللَّهُ بِهِ فَعَلِمَ وَعَلَّمَ وَمَثَلُ مَنْ لَمْ يَرْفَعْ بِذَلِكَ رَأْسًا وَلَمْ يَقْبَلْ خُذَ اللَّهِ الَّذِي أَرْسِلْتُ بِهِ so here, Rasulullah is mentioning a nice lengthy hadith which uses metaphor in terms of ilm and guidance. The example, he says, Sallam, the example of guidance and knowledge with which Allah has sent me is like abundant rain falling on the earth, some of which was fertile soil that absorbed rain water and brought forth vegetation and grass in abundance. And another portion of it was hard and held the rainwater, and Allah benefited the people with it, and they utilized it for drinking, making their animals drink from it, and for irrigation of the land for cultivation. And a portion of it was barren, which could neither hold the water nor bring forth vegetation. Then that land gave no benefits. And then Rasulullah continues, The first example is the example of the person who comprehends Allah's religion and gets benefit from the knowledge which Allah has revealed through me and learns it and then teaches it. The last example is that of a person who does not care for it and does not take Allah's guidance revealed through me. He is like that barren land. Okay. So in the middle one is the one who comprehends Allah's religion and gets benefit from the knowledge but does not go forward in terms of teaching others where he would get the vegetation. So that middle part, that's where basically the middle person who benefits from the Naj, but does not transmit to others, which would be an extra sadaqah on his behalf. A beautiful hadith utilizing metaphors. So in this hadith above, uh, the Prophet ﷺ has divided the status of his own into three categories, those who benefit from the message, those who benefit partially, and those who fail to benefit at all, um, you know, basically pleading ignorance and not caring for it. Okay, and this is through the metaphor of rain and how the effects are different depending on the three different types of land producing different results. So very beautiful hadith in terms of metaphor. But it's not just metaphor. There's other modes of expression used in the Quran and the ahadith. For example, when dealing with misconceptions and false assumptions of the disbelievers, the Qur'an and the Sunnah often use rational thinking and logic. Like in Surah An'am, Ayah 77 to 78. And this is of course the beautiful story of Ibrahim a.s. to his people. Allah says, فَلَمَّا رَأَى الْقَمَرَ بَازِغًا قَالَ هَذَا رَبِّي فَلَمَّا أَفَلَا قَالَ لَإِن لَمْ يَحْدِنِي رَبِّي لَأَكُونَنَّ مِنَ الْكَوْمِ الضَّالِّينَ Allah Azzawajal says, فَلَمَّا رَأَى الْقَمَرَ بَاسِغًا قَالَ هَذَا رَبِّي فَلَمَّا أَفَلَا قَالَ لَإِن لَمْ يَحْدِنِي رَبِّي لَأَكُونَنَّ مِنَ الْكَوْمِ الضَّالِّينَ 
فلما رأى الشمس بازغة قال هذا ربي هذا أكبر فلما أفلت قال يا قوم إني بريء مما تشركون So here Allah Azzawajal says citing the conversation of Ibrahim alayhi salam and when he saw the sun rising he said this is my Lord this is greater هذا أكبر but when it said he said O oh my people, indeed, I am free from what you associate with Allah. Again, rational thinking, logic. Okay. Now, another mode of expression is in terms of the visual. Describing, for example, paradise and hell. Describing the great and horrific description of the Day of Judgment. Okay. Or the signs, the great signs of the Day of Judgment. So here in Surah Waqi, Allah Azza wa Jal says, يَطُوفُ عَلَيْهِمْ وِلْدَانٌ مُخَلَّدُونَ بِأَكْوَابٍ وَأَبَارِيقَ وَكَأْسٍ مِّنْ مَعِينٍ لَا يُصَدَّعُونَ عَنْهَا وَلَا يُنْزِفُونَ وَفَاكِهَةٍ مِّمَّا يَتَخَيَّرُونَ وَلَحْمِ طَيْرٍ مِّمَّا يَشْتَهُونَ In translation here, these ayat of Surah Waqiyah, Allah Azawajal says, describing those who are entering into paradise, there will circulate among them young boys made eternal who are carrying with them vessels and pitchers and a cup of wine from the flowing spring. No headache will they have from this wine, nor will they be intoxicated. And whatever fruit they want, they select. Okay. And it continues. And then Allah Azawajal then, after a few ayat then says, وَأَصْحَابُ الشِّمَالِ مَا أَصْحَابُ الشِّمَالِ فِي سَمُومٍ وَحَمِيمٍ وَظِلٍ مِّيَحْمُومٍ لَا بَارِدٍ وَلَا كَرِيمٍ And then Allah describes the horror and the pain of the, those denizens who enter the hellfire. And He says, And the companions of the left, what are the companions of the left? They will be in scorching fire and scalding water. Fi samumi wa hamim, and a shade of black smoke, and their shade will be smoke and not anything of coolness. But these are the visual modes of expression in the Quran. Again, these are different ways in which you can people can get hit in a sense, in terms of guidance, in terms of shaking the minds and softening their hearts so that they can pay attention to the truth and the haq which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings to them through His Quran. So these modes of expression and literary styles used by the Qur'an, the Sunnah, should be understood well by Muslims today. Because they're powerful tools to convey the message of Islam and through da'wah in the most effective way. And again, we have a different audience each time. You can't just basically give the same medicine to different people. You have to consider the sensibilities of people who are giving da'wah to. You can't just spoon feed people the same message. I mean, you have to Consider their sensibilities. You have to also, the message has to be conveyed in a different manner depending on the person's personality, inclination, thought pattern, education, background, culture. All these different considerations should be done as we are giving da'wah and explaining this great deen. Okay? Or if we are giving nasiha to our fellow Muslim brother because also there are also various backgrounds and understanding and sensibilities. Rational proofs and expressions should be used for those who are more rational or academically inclined, for example. So da'wah altogether needs to be individualized so that the message can be given in the most effective way. Well, this is just a low tangent regarding uh, the whole use of metaphors and different modalities in which da'wah should be transmitted. Let's go forward and look at the first pillar, the shahada from this great hadith. So the first part of the shahada is testifying that there is nothing worthy of worship except Allah. La ilaha illallah. And we should say this shahada frequently, reminding ourselves about this ultimate testification. And this is the difference between Jannah and Jahannam. This is the difference between eternal damnation and eternal bliss. Just that one testification. Okay, the few seconds, this is what life is all about for us. But it's not just that simple. So there's several conditions. There's actually seven conditions of the shahada 
But the first part of the shahada begins with a negation and then an affirmation. Okay, so we're negating all ilas or objects of worship and then affirming worship for Allah only. Okay, and this is not that simple just to verbally testify. There's seven conditions of the shahada as stated by the scholars. Number one is knowledge, to understand what the shahada means. The second one is certainty, having no doubt about anything in the Quran or the authentic sunnah. Well, this is very important, not having any shak. Then acceptance, by the tongue and also by the heart of what the shahada implies. Then is submission and compliance, and its actual physical enactment by doing good deeds. Then the next is to say the shahada sincerely, truthfully, with honesty. Number six is ikhlas. To do it solely for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal. And the last is hub, mahabba. To love the shahada and to love its implications and requirements and what it stands for. So it's not just an expression of the tongue, it's much more than that. It has conditions which need to be fulfilled. And that's very important in this day and age where we're filled with all these different vices, all these different shubahat and shahawat, all these doubts which sort of waver around us. As we fulfill all these seven different conditions, our iman is set. That first peg, that first pillar is established so that this house of ours is not going to collapse. So that's the first part of the shahada. And the testification in the Arabic language, shahada, shahida, means to know and believe, to speak and publicize. So all these different meanings encompass the what shahada stands for. The second part of the shahada, as we go forward, is testifying that Muhammad Wasallam is Allah's messenger. And this carries six conditions. So number one is to believe in the Prophet ﷺ in whatever he has conveyed to us. And of course, this is through authentic narrations. If there is a weak, daif narration, then that's not something we necessarily, it's not binding upon us. This is not what our deen or our fiqh is based on. Our fiqh is based on sahih transmissions. Okay. And then is, Atiyullah wa Rasul, to obey Allah and likewise to obey the messenger as commanded by Allah in whatever he has commanded us to do. And then is to stay away from or avoid whatever he has prohibited وسلم, in our lives. The next is ittiba, to follow, to follow and emulate the Prophet in our ibadat, in our akhlaq, our manners, and in our deen, our way of life. Then is mahabba, to love him more than we love ourselves, our family, and anything else in the world. Okay? Because this is, he is Rasulullah He is the person who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose out of all humanity to bring us the final and perfected version of the guidance. And next is to understand, to practice and promote this sunnah in the best way possible without creating any chaos and material harm. So this is important. We have to not force the sunnah upon others, but to exemplify just like as the Prophet ﷺ did in his most beautiful mannerisms. Okay. And this is why we have to gain naj, and this from inshallah from this course we can also perhaps establish the sixth part of fulfilling the shahada and the second part in terms of believing in Muhammad ﷺ as his last messenger. Going forward, now let's go to the second very important pillar which is the salah, iqamat is salah or iqam is salah as the hadith mentions. Okay. This is a more broader aspect than just performing. Okay. This is establishing. We establish a prayer by fulfilling it to the best of our ability and also do, do it regularly. And just like in terms of Islam and Iman, there is a outer aspect of salah and there's an internal aspect. Okay, The outer is of course the arkan of salah in terms of doing all the outer aspects, the wudu and the, for example, the standing, the ruku 
and this sajda. However, there's also an internal aspect where we connect with Allah Azawajal internally. We recite the Quran silently. But we're saying it to Allah Azawajal. We're paying attention and we're looking to Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala. We're communicating with Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala as the internal aspect of salah, which is also an essential part of that. Okay. So it is important that we follow these conditions and not violate them if we truly want to fulfill the second pillar of establishing the salah. We should remember that Allah Azawajal initially commanded us to pray 50 times a day and it was eventually reduced to 5 times. Again, recall the great journey of the Prophet ﷺ during Isra and Miraj where Rasul ﷺ was gifted with the salah for us. Okay. And by the time it was brought to us, it became 5 times a day. Initially it was 50. Okay. Despite being reduced to 5 daily prayers, however, alhamdulillah, by the mercy and blessing of Allah, its reward equals that of 50 salah or salawat. The prayer times are very reasonably spread out throughout the day and can help us manage our time. Okay. The salah also does many other things such as increases the unity of the Muslim community by causing them to meet during the congregational prayers. This leads to a more caring and close-knit society. These are just some of the few of many reasons that the prayers should not be seen as a burden for us as unfortunately some Muslims regard them today. From this picture on this slide, for example, we see the essentiality or the essential nature of the salah on every Muslim. Okay? Regardless of their disabilities, regardless of their illness, they have to pay the salah. Okay? So even if they don't have legs or hands, it's still an obligation, they have to do it to the best of their ability. Because this is a essential aspect, a reflex of the shahadatain that you do the salah. You bend your head to Allah as a reflection, as a reflex action of understanding and fulfilling the shahada. Okay. So even if you're in a state where you cannot even move, you still do it to the best of your ability and even if you have to do it in your head. Okay. And that's another long discussion, but it is so important that we establish the salah in our lives and make it regular and elevate ourselves in terms of our khushu, our attention, and its perfection. So going further and discussing the iqam salah the ulama say that iqam salah implies the following. Number one, doing the wudu, ablution in the proper way. Okay, number two, to perform the salah within its time frame. Then also to do jama'ah, congregation. This is very important. 27 times more reward of praying. Of There's 20 times, and this is very important. Okay, call it the third is to perform the salah in congregation or jama'ah, where the reward is 27 times more than if you would pray alone. And this is based on Sahih Hadith. And this is where the Prophet says, Salatul Jama'ati Tafdalu Salatul Faddi Bisabi Wa'ishirina Daraja. So try as much as possible to do the Salah in Jama'ah, to go to the Masjid. And if you can go to the Masjid, establish Salah in Jama'ah in your home. It is so unfortunate that so many Muslims pray separately in their homes while they can easily join with their family members. It's pathetic. This is not the way the Prophet saw some. We cannot be praying individually in our, in our homes if there's more than one person there. Join with your son. Join with your brother or your spouse or your daughter. Pray together. This is something which is haq upon us. This is part of the sunnah. This is establishing the sunnah. This is not the way to pray separately in our homes or in other places where we can join together. This is very important to do salah in jama'ah. And this goes against the sunnah if we do it individually when there is not a legitimate reason not to do it in congregation. So that's very important for the unity and to go forward, make Islam progress in our societies, jama'ah. Number four is to fulfill the conditions of salah and there are six conditions of salah. There is number one, the niyyah. And this is a given if you are, for example, doing wudu for the salah, that's automatic. 
Then number two is having the wudu and to be ritually pure, to be clean from najasat, including wearing clean clothes, and also to have a place of prayer where there's no najasat there. So this is pretty much automatic. I mean, all of us have do that and fulfill that and often even go to the extent of using a prayer rug over the carpet to even be extra clean in terms of the place of prayer. Now, another thing is the covering of the aura. Okay, and that's a given as well. That's something which all of us do for the men. It's from navel to the knees, including the shoulders. And for the women, it's everything except for the face, hands, and feet. Then it's the direction of the qibla. And this is where it's important for you to, if you can, carry a compass with you or at least be cognizant of where the sun is. Okay, If it's night, know the Big Dipper because it points to the North Star. And that's where you can discern where's northeast okay and if you can't then carry a compass with you but all these means are there and of course for example in terms of the timetable performing the prayer is due time always carry the timetable with you in your wallet or your pocketbook number five in terms of the overall iqamati swala is to observe the proper adab of the salah such as khushu and humility so you're basically focusing on the place where you're going to do the sajda. You're not thinking about other things. You're not, shaitan again is trying to snap you out of focus of salah, trying to make you remember things you've forgotten, trying to distract you. And this is very important. All of us are distracted by uh, the effects of shaitan's things. So you have to try to have the khushu and the submission. And number six is to follow the sunnah actions in our salah. Study the salah, make our salah more detailed with different atkar, to elongate it, to recite various ayahs of the Qur'an, to increase our Qur'an. This all enhances our salah. Now we're going to transition to the third pillar, which is the zakah. Okay. And this is the, refers to the Obligatory sadaqah given yearly to those wealthy or those who have wealth and whose income is above a certain minimum level, which is called nisab. It is given primarily to the poor Muslims, and the giving of zakah has been pointed out by the Prophet ﷺ for certain items, calculated in certain ways of percentages and under certain conditions. So it's important for us to know all these different details, which we cannot completely go over in this brief hadith. The ulama say that the knowledge and the details of zakah become obligatory when a person owns the type of property or thing on which zakah is obligatory. So for example, farmers, traders, or property owners need to know the conditions and percentages of zakah that they are obliged to give. Okay. And also the, no- the knowledge of zakah is now widespread and readily accessible. I mean, you can simply just open up an app or program on your computer to be able to calculate the zakah. We have zakah calculators out there. It's very easy. It's not that difficult. Okay, 2.5%. That's the magic number. And what is the major ayah which tells us about zakah and who to give the zakah to? Allah Azza wa Jal says, إِنَّمَا الصَّدَقَاتُ لِلْفُقَرَاءِ وَالْمَسَاكِينِ وَالْعَامِلِينَ عَلَيْهَا وَالْمُؤَلَّفَةِ قُلُوبُهُمْ وَفِي الرِّقَابِ وَفِي الرِّقَابِ وَالْغَارِمِينَ وَفِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَابْنِ السَّبِيلِ فَرِيضَةً مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَاللَّهُ عَلِيمٌ حَكِيمٌ Allah Azawajal says, Zakah, expenditures are only for the poor, and for the needy, and for those employed to collect zakah, and for bringing hearts together for Islam, and for freeing captives or slaves, and for those in debt, and for the cause of Allah, and for the stranded traveler. An obligation of Allah, or by Allah, and Allah is knowing wise. So here we see the people which get the zakah. And it's important also to highlight the last part, which is Wafi Sabilillah. And here this often is used by certain organizations, certain people who are doing certain Islamic projects to promote or use that project as zakah. We have to be very careful because 
Zakah number one is for the impoverished people. Okay, and all these other categories which are mentioned. At the last, at the end is Fi Sabilillah, which is in the path of Allah. So if there are people who are poor in the community, if there are people, for example, who are in debt, and they're basically on the brink of Ma'adullah being homeless, if there are people who are long-term travelers, for example, in a certain country, those, those people have more of a haq for zakah than, for example, a sadaqa project where it is benefiting the community but not per se necessary. So you make the judgment. So fi sabila often is to promote Islam, for example, whether it's jihad or for da'wah, classically. And not every cause, every abdul cause becomes necessary in that category of zakah. So we have to be careful because this is the fourth. This is the third pillar of Islam. Okay. In general, we should, number one, prioritize the needy and the poor and those projects. And the other Afdal projects really often do not fulfill the criteria of zakah. Allahu a'lam. Okay. But if there's like a expressing need, for example, for da'wah, for social service, uh, for other things which are needed and beneficial for the community, or like a school and there's no naj whatsoever and everyone's wealthy, then inshallah this is fi sabillah, wallahu a'lam. Let's continue to the fifth pillar which is the hajj. And I'm doing fifth because fourth would be the psalm. But in this hadith, uh, psalm is mentioned last. Okay, But no problem. So hajj is an obligation which we need to do once in our lifetime. It becomes obligatory when the required conditions are fulfilled. For example, if you have enough money or if you're able to. Okay. So if you're financially able to, we should not delay Hajj. Sometimes there's problems in getting a visa, which is beyond our control. Sometimes we are, have a handicap in terms of serious illness, which prevents us from going to Hajj. Our doctors prohibit it because we have 10 different medical problems. You know, for example, if you're a cancer patient on chemotherapy and have enough money, but it's difficult because you can easily get really sick. Okay, you don't want to get meningitis, for example. Then it's not incumbent on you to do Hajj. So Hajj is not incumbent on everyone. You have to obviously have the money, have to, the capabilities to travel, the health as well. Okay. But if you have all these, do not delay the Hajj because then we can be liable for sin if we then get to a condition or a state where we cannot do Hajj. And according to some scholars, if we have the financial means to do Hajj and if we've done it, then it's better instead of doing another Hajj, a second Hajj, it's better for us to use that money to help others in fulfilling their obligations, inshallah. Okay. We're going to be rewarded for this and this is also, it helps the community and it's Sadaqa Jariya, inshallah. So this is where, for example, Sheikh Jamal Badi recommends instead of doing a second hajj to use that money for Sadaqa Jariya, inshallah. Okay, so, so many people can benefit, perhaps, if you've done a hajj from that hajj for other things. Other aspects of hajj which are important to consider is the sunan, the adab and mannerisms. Okay, and it's a problem because in hajj we see the lack of adab, lack of akhlaq, and lack of knowledge of the Muslim ummah from everywhere. Okay. The adab is not there, the mannerisms are not there, uh, we're not emulating the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, we're not being nice to each other, it's a shame. Okay. And this is the time where we should be on our best taqwa, our best manners. We're going before Allah Azawajal. And part of that, in terms of the Fulfillment of the rights of Allah is also to fulfill the rights of your fellow Muslim brother. Not to push and shove them. Not to give them harm. To be kind and gentle. To smile at them. Okay. But unfortunately we do anything other than that. And this is again a reflection of the weak state of our iman and the hatred unfortunately which is within the hearts of the Muslims to their brethren. Ma'adullah. And unfortunately again a reflection that there's that many incidents happen also because of the ignorance and the negligence of the proper sunan. Just as a side note, often you know it's a problem also in the Hajj when certain 
pathways to the Hajj are blocked because uh, you know, so-and-so prince is coming and doing their Hajj. And this is also against the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu as well. And you know, to basically make it more difficult for masses of the people who are doing Hajj because someone is you know, great in status. It's just really it's just a reflection of the ignorant state that we're in. Okay. Everyone in Hajj is equal. No one should have priority. Everyone has to have the same burdens. Oh, so what if they have a certain status? So what if they're a prince so-and-so? And it's just a shame that these things happen in the Hajj and should not be allowed. And the next and fourth pillar is Asom, which is the fasting. And again, highlights the importance of the month of Ramadan, which is a training period which obliges all Muslims to do Asom from sports. Like you have the training period. For example, for the football season, you have the preseason. And preseason is actually much more difficult and strenuous than actually the regular season where you're doing intense training so that you can be able to play until the season is completed in your best form. And similarly, Ramadan is like that. where we, It's a training period where we actually are training ourselves from even the halal, which is from eating, from marital relations and drinking for Allah Zawajal, for increasing our taqwa. Okay. And here in this beautiful month, the reward for both obligatory and recommended deeds is multiplied. And the performance of these deeds serves to increase our taqwa and our iman so that we can become, inshallah, better Muslims. Okay. So these extra good deeds such as praying in the masajids, the tahajjud prayer, the reciting of Qur'an, the sadaqah, the helping and caring of others should be continued outside of Ramadan. Ramadan is also the month of the Qur'an. And we should strive to read as much of the Qur'an as possible. The Prophet ﷺ was asked by Abdullah bin Amr, Ya Rasulullah, Fikam akra'ul Qur'ana qala fi shahr. He said, O oh Allah's Messenger, in how many days should I complete the reading of the Qur'an? The Prophet ﷺ replied, in one month. So, in other words, in order to complete the reading of the entire Qur'an in one month, one juz or chapter should be read daily. And this is something we should do all the time and not wait for the month of Ramadan. If we're not capable of achieving this, then at least we should try to read one or two pages a day, a quarter of a hizb. Okay. In the same way, we should try to do the night prayer, the hajjud, be it only four rakah or two or four rakah on the nights outside of Ramadan. Easy way to do that is to wake up before a few minutes before the Fajr Salah and fulfill the Tahajjud Salah that way. Next is consistency in the Nawafil deeds, in the supererogatory deeds, the extra deeds. And consistency in an action, however small, is more beloved than an action which is done in large amounts inconsistently. The Prophet ﷺ said, The Prophet ﷺ said, The most beloved deeds to Allah are the ones that are continuous, even if they are not very many. Okay. At the same time, while encouraging you to do these supererogatory actions, we should not impose on ourselves the performance of these non-obligatory actions when the Sharia has not made it as such. If one imposes this nafil act on himself, then this can lead to overimposing that action and the result will be more negative. It can be in abandoning that good deed altogether. So it is sufficient that the extra deed or the nafil act be done with ease and at one's own convenience provided that it can be done constantly. And there's a lot of great hikmah in the different nawafil acts. And they're of different types. Okay. And this is to test the slaves of Allah in different ways. They're also like a minimum level of actions of worship at the obligatory level. So for example, you know, you have the psalm of Ramadan, but you have other nawafil psalm, the fasting, the light days of the month, you know, the middle days when you have the full moon, the three middle days. 
then you have the fasting of Mondays and Thursdays, then you have the fasting of occasions such as Ashura, or the months of Shawwal. Those are supererogatory, those are Afdal. And some people are able to do it better than others. For example, I know one brother who regularly does the best fast, the fasting of the Prophet Dawood Ali Salam. Okay. And he's able to do it, it's amazing. Okay, much of the time. You have people, mashallah, in this ummah who are able to do these great deeds because of the ability that Allah has blessed them with. I mean, the same brother, and interestingly enough, when he was in college, he was able to do the hajj based on doing a diet of cup of noodles for two years and saving up the stipend that his parents would give him for food. Okay. Subhanallah. So you have, alhamdulillah, these brothers who are able to do these extra things and elevate their iman, elevate their ranks, and they're just among us. They're among us hidden. And the way I found this out actually is when he was fasting on Saturday. And interesting enough, you know, it's not afdal, it's not preferred to do a nafil fast on Saturday. Like you should avoid doing fasting on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, because Friday, of course, is our Eid in a sense. And Saturday is the, the day of worship for Ahlul uh, Kitab, Banu Israel, and Sunday is for Nasara. So those days, it's better not to do it. But he was doing a Saturday, so I'm like, why are you doing it? And then basically I found out that he was doing the fast of Dawood, alayhi salam. MashaAllah. So may Allah elevate this brother and others like him. There's very few in the community who can do these type of psalm, Monday and Thursdays, for example. Anyway, so those people who could do the psalm, MashaAllah, those people who could wake up early and do more ibadat and kiamulayl, those people who can do the Qur'an, whatever be you have to do nawafil deed, and it's easy for you, go all the way insha'Allah and do it continuously and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will really elevate yourself and also this will be an example for you, for the ummah to do these afdal deeds, nawafil deeds, alhamdulillah. Now, there's a lot of amazing wisdom in the doing the nawafil deeds, whether it's earning higher ranks in terms of knowledge, memorizing hadith or salah, psalm, giving Sadaqah, all these things, so much things Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can reward us with by doing in, on top of the minimum obligation which are encompassed in these five pillars. Okay. So the bottom line is do as many voluntary acts from that which suits your personality okay, and your ability and your strengths. Okay. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made all of us different and all of us have various strengths and weaknesses. Now, turning to another topic, which is thick issues. Okay, so a little more uh, spicy topics. Okay. So, not praying. So, as for the salah, scholars have differed about whether abandoning the prayer or the laziness and neglect removes a person from Islam. Some scholars said that to abandon the prayer or the laziness does not take the person out of the fold of Islam. But others say to abandon the prayer out of laziness alone does take the person out of Islam because they say that Iman is statement and action. Okay. That the minimum action is the salah. So actually the latter view is the strongest view of the scars due to the great evidence from the Quran and the Sunnah. There's so many hadith which support this. Where Rasulullah s.a.w. says, مَنْ صَلَّى صَلَاتَنَا وَاسْتَقْبَلَ قِبْلَتَنَا وَأَكَلَ دَبِيحَتَنَا فَذَلِكَ الْمُسْلِمُ الَّذِي لَهُ ذِمَّةُ اللَّهِ وَذِمَّةُ الرَّسُولِهِ Who, And this is narrated in Bukhari, where the Prophet s.a.w. says, Whoever prays like us, faces our Qibla, and eats our Dhabiha, our slaughtered animals, is a Muslim, and under Allah's Allah's protection and the protection of his apostle. Then, upon Jabir ibn Abdullah, the Nabi Sallallahu said, Qal, Bain al-Kufri wal-Imani tarqu salah. And this is Nari in Tirmidhi, where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, between disbelief and faith in Iman is leaving of the salah. Leaving the salah. 
And there's a jima of the Sahaba as per Abu Huraira. Right? The Sahaba saw the leaving of no action as kufr except the leaving of salah. Therefore, the one who abandons the prayer becomes a kafir. The one who abandons the prayer does not pray at all, whether it be out of laziness or whatever, becomes a kafir. But of course, it is very important for us not to do takfir. Okay, this is for our information. Okay. We cannot call someone a kafir unless he is taken to the qadi in an Islamic state who makes that ruling upon him. Okay. It's not us. We're not the judge. However, for our own selves, know that if you leave salah, whether whatever excuse you make, then technically you are in that category. And that is the best opinion. And it's so important. We cannot leave the salah. Our salah is an essential pillar which is right next to the Shahadatayn. And it's important also to advise our fellow brothers and Muslims. So, so many Muslims, they believe in Allah and the Messenger, but they do not pray at all. Okay, they do not pray. Even in Muslim countries, we have to advise these people, have to plead with them as much as possible. Show them the evidences, be kind to them and gentle, but admonish them and encourage them as much as possible to pray. Start with the most important prayer, such as, for example, the Fajr and the Isha, or the, just the middle prayer, if they cannot pray at all. Something. Because once this gets rolling, once their engine gets started, inshallah, it will already, all those different sins that they are surrounded by, whether it may be drinking, whether it may be improper relations, whatever big sin that they're doing, it will basically dissipate and disappear when they start to do the Salah. But it's important to be very logical and be very intelligent when doing the nasiha to those people who are not praying, but not make it a little thing. It is not a little thing. It's a huge matter. And it is maybe a cause for them out of Islam because of leaving the salah for whatever reason. So highlights from this hadith of the five pillars. Okay. I mean, all the pillars of Islam have rulings, conditions, and mannerisms apply to them. It is important that we know their ahkam, their rulings, their sunnah, the sunan of the Prophet the adab, the etiquettes, and regularly remind ourselves of the importance of all these pillars. This is more important before Ramadan, for example, for Psalm, or before performing the hajj, so we can perform the pillars properly and according to Sharia. Okay. So, number one also highlights that Islam's outward actions are based on these five pillars. And in one sense, these pillars are there are three different types. For example, you have the testimony of faith, which is based on action of the tongue and the heart, the inner. That's the shahadatain, the most important. Without that, forget it. Eternal damnation, ma'adullah. With it, at least you're guaranteed. You're guaranteed to go to Jannah. You know, once David Letterman, the comedian, he said, he made a statement that Saddam Hussein will go to hellfire forever. How is he to make that, you know, that statement? Yes, he was a brutal dictator. Yes, perhaps he killed so many. But at the end, he still was holding his Quran. He still was professing faith. So even for a person of his, his rank, such a low level, despite by so many because of the brutality, things he did against even then for him is salvation. If he, if he is true to his statement, one day he will, inshallah, enter Jannah because of that shahadatain. The salah, again, very important. So many different benefits we have from outside a religious realm in terms of unity, in terms of akhuwa, in terms of regularity of time schedule, in terms of so many different things that salah does. It disciplines us, allows us to take a break from the crazy life that we live in. So salah is an act of worship, which we do with the body only. Okay. Similarly, fasting is also an act of the body only. While the zakah is with the wealth only. And hajj combines the actions of the body and also with spending of wealth. Actions are in terms of 
how we, our bodies utilize to apply all these different beautiful pillars. And to add to that, when we do the fara'id, whether the salah, the psalm, the zakah, it also teaches us to go further and go further and do extra supererogatory actions on top of our fara'id. The nawafil deeds add this beautification to do everything with ihsan. And this is exemplified by the nawafil. As to the pillars, it beautifies this house which we're building and further support the pillars. As we mentioned before, of all these pillars, the most important are the, the shahada and the salah. And these are essential to becoming a Muslim and essential to enter the Jannah. So let's look at some questions which you should be able to answer after this session just to polish your understanding of this hadith. Number one, how have we come to use the word five pillars from this hadith? Number two, who is the narrator of this hadith? Name one of his unique characteristics with respect to the other companions. Number three, what are the three conditions of the shahada? Three of the seven. Number four, what is the difference between salah and ikamati salah? Number five, name two of the preconditions of doing the salah. The second pillar of its benefits. Number six, can a Muslim truly be a Muslim while abandoning the salah out of laziness or procrastination? Why or why not? Number seven, a Muslim community slash country is impoverished despite it being educated. One imam is collecting donations and zakah for a school which needs funding. Is this correct and why or why not? Number eight, how does the nawafil allow for Muslims to use their abilities to excel in Islam after fulfilling the fard ibadah? And the last one, which hadith book or books is this hadith found in? Jazakallah khairan for your attendance. Subhanaka Allahu wa hamdik wa nashhadu wa la ilaha illa anta wa astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayka assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh